Okay, so we are out the black belt now, but no, we aren't. We're still in the black belt, okay? On election day in Ufala, white men killed seven and injured nearly 70 unarmed black voters. Black voters were also driven from the polls in Mobile, Darlene Clark Hine, and others conclude that Democrats won the election and, in their minds, redeemed Alabama. The Populist Party, composed mainly of discontented white farmers, reached out to African Americans. So here we have another alliance going on between African Americans and whites. It first was with the uh, Republican Party, which by this time uh, had no power okay, in the South. And now you have a group of white farmers who are forming an alliance, and it will be known as the Populist Party. The Alabama Farmers Alliance entered politics in 1890. Agricultural Commissioner Reuben Cobb lost uh, in the election uh, that he ran for governor but the alliance elected many candidates to the Alabama legislature. So this is significant in that the populists were uh, making a political presence in Alabama. Acknowledged in moments in Alabama history is the fact that leading Democrats supported the Klan and the party, and both groups were indistinguishable. <coughs> And that will continue in Alabama, well, I can't say that, but the conservative <laughs> interests within the Democratic Party would continue in Alabama. Historians believe that Cobb won more votes uh, than his uh, opponent, but that Black Belt Democrats stuffed the ballot boxes and stole the votes. And somewhere on the, the screen you will find fraud, you will find... Uh, ballot stuffing and some other indications that the election of 2000 presidential election was not the first controversial election in uh, America. It's been going on for a long time. However, the populists lost the presidential elections of 1892 and 1896. Hine and others contend that this is the reason that you had the lynching nationwide uh, within southern states of 235 people after that election. And sh they didn't follow it up with a clear kind of commentary, but obviously what we see happening in America and the South particularly is that lynching was becoming very prominent in keeping black people from the polls, keeping them uh, politically ineffective. In addition to employing violence, state officials look to more <laughs> civil and legal methods to disenfranchise African Americans. Of all the black codes, the most repressive were the vacancy, vacancy laws, vagrancy laws, which permitted unemployed African Americans to be arrested and fined. And any African American who could not pay a fine could be hired out. Hired out means to work on somebody's farm most likely. In Alabama, a voter had to have a good moral character and be innocent of 30 crimes. And when I got this note, I'm like, well, who commits 30 crimes, uh, who's counting, and how do you keep tally? But obviously, the intention was to keep African Americans from voting. If you didn't have a job, okay, and you were standing on the corner hoping to get employed for day labor, okay, I mean, you might be picked up simply because law officials wanted to harass you, uh, they wanted to make sure that African-American men had a criminal record. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Okay. Um, 
to make sure that African Americans remain politically inept, restrictions were designed to prevent African Americans from voting without violating the 15th Amendment, which prohibited disenfranchisement based on race. Let me pause here and say, particularly for the students, after the Civil War, there were three important amendments passed. One I will preface later, the 13th, okay, abolished slavery. The 14th established citizenship for former slaves. And the 15th gave black men the right to vote. So what we're seeing here, now Southern leaders wanted to make African American voting or uh, prohibit African American voting from the statutory provisions without offending those amendments. For example, by restricting the primaries to white voters, only black voters were excluded, but not actually disenfranchised. These practices were sanctioned. by Plessy versus Ferguson and Williams versus Mississippi. And those are two court cases maybe you need to look up. But obviously, you know Plessy established the principle of separate but equal. These cases noted that the laws sanctioning racial segregation did not on their faces discriminate between the races. Therefore, they did not violate the 15th Amendment. Although the 13th Amendment abolished slavery, thousands of African Americans were trapped in peonage, otherwise known as sharecropping. You'll see that on the board. Because obviously making a living, having an income, having good moral character is all uh, related to what? Voting. By 1890, both black and white farmers between 58 to 62 percent were land they did not own. Now, the important point here is that white farmers were trapped in this system as well, but they didn't understand it. Well, they did, but race became more important to them. And so if they had aligned themselves with African Americans, they could have made a political statement to the great land home owners, the uh, southern policy makers, but they failed to do so. Despite the depravity of sharecropping, more than 100,000 African American families managed to acquire forms <coughs> of their own. And that's what I emphasize to my students when I explain sharecropping, okay? A lot of African Americans beat the system. You know how they beat the system? They worked hard, okay? The families um, put their resources together. They sent their children to school, and they were able to become landowners themselves. According to Macmillan in Alabama, the poll tax was made a prerequisite for voting and Income was assigned to education by designated state conventions. The poll tax is a tax you pay to vote. How many black people had money to pay to vote? Obviously, they were already prohibited from voting, but it's like adding layers of cement uh, on the person that's already laying down. Writing in Negro Education in Alabama, Horace Mann Bond notes that because of the clout of African American vote in concentrated populations, as we said, like the Black Belt, black schools in these counties had longer terms and paid their teachers higher salaries <laughs> than did white schools in the same counties. I found that interesting. However, these voting and electoral benefits would be rescinded as African Americans were disenfranchised. African Americans also faced literacy tests, which appeared to be neutral, but the administration of which was discriminatory. For example, if given a literacy test, it would be simple for whites. 
however, very complicated for African Americans. And the question became, who graded the test? And we all know the answer to that. Authors McLean and Tarver, who have a new uh, American government book out called uh, American Government in Black and White, also revealed that the grandfather clause exempted people from literacy tests who had been able to vote at the end of the Civil War and obviously applied to whites only. Originating in Louisiana in 1898, the grandfather clause called for an addition to the permanent registration list of the names of all male persons whose fathers and grandfathers were qualified to vote on January 1st, 1867. So I want you to note the date, January 1st, 1867. <coughs> of course, at this time, no African American was qualified to vote. Another restriction of political participation was to purposely draw the boundaries of a voting area so as to leave out certain residents. We call this gerrymandering, and it should be on the board too. It's a historical term, and I contend that it's a uh, modern term as well. Still, Registers found ways to reject African American applicants in other ways. Some counties required that each applicant be sponsored by another voter. In counties where there was not a single African American voter, obviously they had no sponsors. And that was the intent of all of these different techniques to keep African Americans from voting, that you wouldn't have a chance. If one shoe didn't fit, then we'll find a pair that does. In my possession this morning, because I did mention uh, gerrymandering to you, I have from the, uh, the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund a teaching tool that if any of you want to pick up, I'll be happy to leave it with you. But it talks about districting and how that's a step in political empowerment. That's why the Shelby case concerns me very much. Also in my possession, I have some voting applications. So I'm just a walking uh, what do I call myself? voting advocate. OK, now you have to listen very closely, because I'm concluding now. According to John Hope Franklin, the post-reconstruction until the early 20th century struggle for African Americans to vote was a battle to control the South and maybe the nation. See, voting is not, it's localized, but obviously you see it has national consequences. So when people uh, design strategies for voting, they're not looking just as that at their local communities. They're looking at the power of the vote nationally. This battle involved working class whites against the landed aristocracy, northern industrialists against southern whites, and all whites against African Americans. Poor African Americans didn't have a chance. According to political scientist Walton, and Smith, the main beneficiaries throughout American history have been Southern whites. For example, look at the present uh, case going on about uh, the debt ceiling, budgetary questions, okay? These are very conservative interests that block uh, the momentum for working and poor people to achieve. They continue to note that conservative whites have been given the freedom to oppress African Americans first as slaves and then in a caste system. The real losers during post reconstruction until the early, of tw early 20th century were African Americans who were reduced 
to political impotency and economic peonage. Of the 101,471 African American males of voting age in Alabama in 1900, guess how many registered after the new constitution was written? 3,000. Interestingly, Bond, Wold, Benstock, Franklin, Delessis, Groover, Bowles, and Gentis all concur that the winners for control of the South were the Northern industrialists who were able to control the national economy. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Locke. Um, pulling off my moderator hat for a minute, uh, pulling off my archivist hat. Um, Many of you, I know, uh, computer savvy, uh, write this down. Go to Google and pull up the proceeding of the 1901 Alabama Constitution and Convention and read the proceeding. It covers everything that Dr. Lockton has just told you. Uh, it is a very important document. It is built up electronically. And I urge you, if you're really interested in this topic, and of course, the petition by Booker T. Washington, which gives the other side. One other thing that I'm sure that our panelists are going to bring to you, not only does that 1901 Constitution disenfranchise 99% of African Americans, but it effectively removed poor whites at the same time. So it's a, it's a very restricted document. And one of the reasons for this key, our current constitution was the threat that had occurred in the 1890s of poor whites and poor blacks forming a political coalition. And that could not have be at that time. So uh, I was told, yes, um, that. <laughs> but students in particular, make sure you look at that proceeding. It's available electronically. It's some good reading. It's excellent reading. Next. Give the link again. Give that link again. Well, it's available at the State Archives uh, electronic uh, document site. But if you can just Google it, Proceedings of the 1901 Alabama Constitutional Convention. Uh, you should be able to get it. And I put my discussion off at 1900. 1900, yes. <laughs> because Dr. <laughs> Noriel. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jeff Noriel. <clears throat> I, I'm Jeff Noriel from the University of Tennessee. Um, and I think I am here because I have uh, studied um, for a long time uh, the situation with regard to voting in Alabama and the South. Um, and I, um, I did a, did a, a book, a dissertation a book about the uh, civil rights movement in Tuskegee. And which is essentially a study of voting rights, and I wrote about Dr. Patton, uh, <clears throat> who was a student leader there in the 1960s. Um, and the other reason, I suppose, main reason, is that I uh, published a biography of Booker T. Washington um, a few years ago, <clears throat> and um, a lot of that has to do with Washington's <coughs> position uh, on voting rights. Um, now, uh, in, in professorial fashion, let me begin by telling you, the students, and anybody else who's taking notes, that I'm going to make four fundamental points in this uh, talk, um, and, or four fundamental themes that I want you to, to get. I, I'm going to come back to them. They're going to reinforce some things that other panelists have already said. First of all, is that African Americans uh, have always been 
uh, in the process of pushing for voting rights. We heard earlier about uh, through, the, uh, through the Reconstruction period and then, and then through the 1890s. Uh, <clears throat> we heard also that at times the national government, the federal government, supported black voting rights uh, and but we're going to find out that the, the national government gave up on That's the second thing. Uh, the role of the national government is, is inconsistent, back and forth, wishy-washy. Mm -hmm. Number three is that whites uh, in the South, and Alabama in particular, uh, have always opposed blacks having voting rights. Uh, <clears throat> we can say that at times the opposition uh, was weakened, sometimes it was defeated, um, but the reality is that uh, even today there's huge evidence, I think, that whites still oppose blacks having any political power. The fourth point I'm going to make is that uh, with regard to voting rights and the larger matter of the civil rights movement, I'm going to argue, probably very briefly, that the civil rights movement and the and the the uh, sustained commitment to voting rights uh, in Alabama, Montgomery, the, across the South, began in the late 1930s. We we have a sense that the civil rights movement, uh, or we're taught, uh, students are taught nowadays that the civil rights movement began uh, with Rosa Parks on a bus in 1955, and it ended in Memphis in a tragic assassination in 1968. I think that's wrong. I mean, of course, those are very important things. But if we're going to fully understand the broad movement for uh, equality, for human rights, uh, <clears throat> we have to, in this country with regard to African Americans, you have to see it as a much longer uh, story than that. Now, uh, to try to pick up where from my predecessors uh, up here. Uh, <clears throat> In talking about the movement for disfranchisement in Alabama or in the South in the, 19, uh, in the 1890s or uh, early first decade of the 20th century, uh, we've often been taught that some African Americans consented to disfranchisement, and the main culprit or the main bad guy in that consent typically uh, has focused on Booker Washington. Now, uh, I any of you, some of you look to be of an age where you heard a lot of this rhetoric, I know Dr. Patton did in the 1960s, where uh, Booker Washington was an Uncle Tom, a bad guy, who delayed the day of, uh, of freedom. Uh, and I, I want to say that I think uh, that was uh, <clears throat> entirely wrong. And I want to tell you a little bit about Booker Washington and his relationship. Washington, uh, of course, had witnessed or did witness in uh, the late 1890s, with the defeat of populism, uh, the, the force for uh, disfranchisement in all the southern states. It's once the populists were out of the way, then the white conservatives could, uh, <clears throat> could move to take blacks out of politics. They couldn't do it before because the white populists understood that the m method to take blacks out of politics would also take the poor whites out. But once the populist movement was was uh, uh, was defeated, as uh, uh, as Dr. Larkin suggested in 1896, uh, then we see state after state convening a, a disfranchising constitution and uh, <clears throat> and taking blacks out of politics. South Carolina did it in 1895. <clears throat> Louisiana, 1898. Georgia in 1899, uh, Alabama in 1901. Booker Washington fought against these in a public way in every one of these states. <clears throat> of course, he lost. Washington knew that the day of the disfranchisement of African Americans was inevitable. He fought it in public ways uh, <clears throat> because he understood that the next step after taking blacks out of politics was to end black education. <coughs> that, of course, was what Booker Washington was primarily about, was promoting a long-term uh, improvement of black people through, uh, through education. The, the means to do that was to separate 
the, uh, the tax funds for education between that that was taxes paid by blacks and that paid by whites. Uh, if that happened, there would be so little money for black education that, uh, uh, that black education would largely cease to exist, exist except as a private matter. Uh, at the same time, he's fighting publicly against disfranchisement. He is particularly fighting against the separation of the school funds. And while he loses every time, blacks lose every time in these conventions uh, fighting disfranchisement, they win uh, ultimately on not separating the school funds, though, of course, the money uh, devoted to uh, black education is going down uh, throughout the, the period of the disfranchising conventions. Washington made, <coughs> as Joe said, uh, a, a public statement against the disfranchisement in, uh, in Alabama. Uh, and he was behind the scenes talking to people uh, in the convention, whites in the convention, who were his friends. Uh, the disfranchising, uh, the, the, the committee trying to come up with the plans, put into the Alabama convention a grandfather clause that uh, Dr. Larkin explained to you. Uh, <clears throat> uh, there were two men in the, in the convention in, in Alabama who were very afraid that if the disfranchising mechanism stayed in the Alabama Constitution, that the Constitution would be, uh, would be uh, challenged and declared <coughs> unconstitutional by the United States Supreme Court. They were Thomas Goode Jones and uh, William Oates, two white conservative Democrats. Both had been governor. Both had been elected with stolen votes against, uh, <coughs> uh, into office. Uh, they were, you know, typical white conservatives, but they had a, some sense of noblesse oblige that black people should be protected. And Washington was friendly with both of them, and he heard uh, go, uh, Tom Scrooge Jones go on and on about how what a dad, terrible thing the grandfather clause was. And so he, uh, Washington, heard all this, and and thought in that, that Jones might be uh, helpful in the long run in Washington's efforts uh, to thwart disfranchisement. Washington had made a secret uh, a challenge and supported a secret challenge to the grandfather clause in Louisiana. Uh, Jones and Oates knew this. They, they knew it would be challenged. Uh, they didn't know that Booker Washington was behind it. Washington was arranging the whole thing through secret, uh, secret money, although most of the money was his that went into doing that. When Washington heard uh, uh, what Jones said about this uh, uh, in the convention, uh, he arranged uh, through uh, the new president, Theodore Roosevelt, who looked to Washington for Republican patronage appointments in the South. He arranged for Thomas Scoot Jones to get appointed to the vacant uh, federal judgeship here in Montgomery. In the belief that uh, uh, it, when a suit was brought to the new judge, that it might be overturned, that he, that Judge Jones would overturn it, or at least that was the hope, that was the theory. Uh, Washington, of course, never really admitted this. You have to piece it together because everything he did was secret uh, because he knew he couldn't allow for whites to know uh, <clears throat> that a black man was conspiring against the great power of white people in Alabama uh, to end his franchisement. It's an interesting thing, though. There were a group of postal workers here in Montgomery, uh, led by a man named Jackson Giles. Uh, postal workers had a little bit of uh, uh, independence, uh, less fear of white uh, <coughs> uh, 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 violence or, or coercion against them. And a group of uh, uh, these postal workers got together and, uh, and, and used Jackson Giles' name to initiate a suit against the Alabama Constitution immediately afterward. And in, uh, 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 well, Washington immediately heard about this, and he uh, uh, essentially sent his lawyer, the man who's secretly challenging the Louisiana Constitution, to see Jackson Giles here in Montgomery and said, let me represent you in this case. And 
Uh, Giles had no idea that Booker was behind it. Uh, but they figured out a way to put together a whole bunch of lawsuits uh, challenging uh, the, the Alabama Constitution, uh, all of them paid secretly by Washington, all of them with Jackson Giles as the, uh, as the uh, plaintiff, uh, and they made it through. Now, they went into state court, and every state court in Alabama threw it out, uh, and, uh, but... Uh, one finally got to Judge Jones. Judge Jones uh, said, I'm throwing this out. The only thing you can do, your only recourse is to challenge uh, my authority to act, which essentially was his signal to uh, Washington's lawyer to challenge him and go straight to the Supreme Court. So Judge Jones, as wily, as foxy, as, as sneaky as Buffer Washington, essentially collaborated on the testing of it, knowing that he couldn't overrule it, but the men in Washington could. Uh, except, uh, here's the point about the United States Supreme Court, is they change their minds. They read the Constitution in different ways. We know today the United States Supreme Court is reading the Constitution about the voting rights completely differently from the way it had been read uh, for the, the previous 40 years. Uh, he got all the way to the Supreme Court. Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., who would be the foremost judge of civil liberties, a great jurist, was the one who said, well, you know, if the white people in Alabama don't want the black people to vote, who are we, the United States Supreme Court, to, to enforce the 14th and 15th Amendment? And that's the way it got along. That's how the... the uh, uh, the Alabama Constitution ultimately was up, upheld, although it was flagrant, flagrantly anti-black and discriminatory from the very beginning. Okay, so you know, Washington was was tough and committed, but ultimately he couldn't afford to keep going, and they were not having any success. And in the period of the first two decades of the 20th century, uh, there was relatively little progress. We know that all, all but 3,000 black voters in the state were, were disfranchised. But that didn't mean that black people had given up because in the period after, immediately after World War I, starting in 1919, we see the emergence in place after place, in city after city in Alabama, of a chapter of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And this becomes the main institutional basis for civil rights uh, challenges. We see, we see some protests in Birmingham in the mid-1920s by black women uh, demanding that in the aftermath of the suffrage article, the suffrage amendment, that they get to, 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 to vote the Indiana Little uh, incident. We see in the 1930s the emergence of uh, demands for voting rights among black people in Birmingham, especially black industrial workers. But we also see uh, in, uh, in, in cities uh, in Alabama in the 1930s organ, organized efforts. We see a challenge, a legal challenge to the, to the white primary that Dr. Larkin mentioned. We see challenge and that one of those from uh, uh, Mobile, one from Dothan. And we also see the emergence, uh, in starting in 1936, of voting organizations in every uh, city, major city in Alabama, and for that matter, in every major city in the South. You see the creation of the first time for sustained organizations, sometimes called civic clubs, that's what they call it in, in Tuskegee, sometimes called, uh, 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 pardon me? Voters yeah, voters leagues. And there are voters leagues in all, in all over the country. They emerge in 1936, 37, 38. Why? Well, they emerge because black people have, uh, been given an incentive at the national level uh, to change their political affiliation from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party. Franklin Roosevelt had emerged as a friend of small people, 
little people. He wasn't the great open friend of African Americans, but his wife was. And, and the Roosevelt's put forward uh, a sense that the world was changing and black people might be able to change their status. And so you get uh, in Montgomery uh, <coughs> uh, a movement from E.D. Nix, led by E.D. Nixon and a man named Porter, another postal worker. You see a whole group of people led by doctors and lawyers in Birmingham. You see an amazing postal worker coming out of Mobile named John LaFleur. You see an amazing uh, t uh, um, college professor in Tuskegee, Charles G. Gamillion. All these people, and all these, these all happen to be men, of course. Mrs. Parks was intimately involved, all with everything that uh, Nixon did. Uh, here in Montgomery, and there were women involved uh, in crucial roles in Tuskegee. But they are all pushing for the right to vote. And this, the United States Supreme Court, which had turned against civil rights, black rights, black equality, in the aftermath of the Reconstruction, and, and consistently opposed black rights, through the disfranchising conventions and all the other uh, forms of, of discrimination, the creation of the Jim Crow laws, the United States Supreme Court changes again under the influence of the Roosevelt administration. We see in 1938 a new attitude toward equality uh, from the, the Supreme Court, and it's quite interesting. Uh, 19 the Republican Party is based on the fact that, uh, uh, for example, I live in Huntsville, 95% of white males, people that look like me, 95% uh, voted uh, against Barack Obama. They didn't vote for the non-Christian, non-conservative, non-truthful candidate of the Republican Party. They voted against Barack Obama. And the reason that these Tea Party people can be so far out is because they know that 90, that maybe not 95%, because there are a lot of rich whites who, you know, have reason to vote for Republicans. Uh, <clears throat> but the main reason that they can behave that way is because such a huge portion of the white population votes against their economic and political interests for the Republicans against Barack Obama. So, in, in this sense, there is a there is a continuity. I hate to end on such a such a negative, painful thing, but I think it's important to see that there are continuities in history, and there are discontinuities in history, and and uh, because things seemed on an upward positive trajectory toward more equality doesn't mean that the same dynamics, that is, an independent judiciary cannot in uh, 2013, in a case from Alabama, uh, essentially cancel uh, the, the commitment of the president, including Republican presidents, and uh, the, the United States Congress for the continuation of voting rights protection. They did it. They did it. The Republicans uh, uh, in, the, in the Supreme Court did it, just like Oliver Wendell Holmes in 1901 uh, did it to Alabama, blacks in Alabama, uh, over the uh, over the 1901 Constitution. So things change, things get better, but believe me, there's uh, there's no permanent upward trajectory in the protection of uh, equality and freedom uh, for African Americans in this country. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Norrell. Yeah, I would like to give a plug uh, for all of you readers out there of uh, Dr. Norrell's uh, publication, Reaping the Whirlwind. If you really want to understand Alabama politics, particularly in Macon County and Tuskegee. You must, it's a must read. Uh, it is a great publication, and we're so glad to have them with us today. Uh, another plug, uh, Ms. Frasing <laughs> Taylor just gave me a note.
he was talking about electronic documents that are available to anyone who has a computer and internet connection. Uh, she wanted to let us know that the 1866 voter registration list by county is, uh, is available online as well as the 1866 state census. For you African Americans out there, if you're doing genealogy, this is where it all began. This is the first time you have a surname, most of us, not all, but most, 99% of uh, Alabamian. So those are some electronic documents. I think what we are, I keep hearing, I heard from Dr. English, Dr. Lockett, and Norell, is the constitutions. Take a look at those constitutions, particularly the Reconstruction Constitution, 1868, the Redeemer Constitution, 1875, and of course, the current Constitution, 1901, and it would explain the uh, voting issues that we face then and today. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Ms. Hoffman, and she's going to lead us in some discussion. We, oh, we didn't have a question first. <laughs> yeah, I, from anyone, it, it just stays in my mind about the public education, compulsory education to 16, 16 years old, education for, I think, what they call imbeciles, and the name Cardoza, which is coming to my mind. Does anybody, and in, in it in happened during Reconstruction. Does anybody know the specifics of that or know about that? Public education on a national level. And I think the source, because I, um, the source is uh, uh, Dubois' uh, Black Reconstruction. It, I, I, I know that's where it comes from. But I was just wondering if anybody knew. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that public education in this country is the gift of Black Reconstruction by a black man yeah. from D.C. named Cardoza. And I just wanted to share that. I think we've had some great panel discussions from each of our panelists here, and I just kind of want to go through some of the major themes that undergirded each of these um, discussions that were presented by Dr. English, uh, Dr. Larkin, and Dr. Norell. Um, one of the things that Dr. English first began with, or the one of the major major points that I actually garnered from his discussion, was that during the time of Reconstruction. What was interesting is that we didn't have any African Americans that were actually elected to uh, political office. Um, that I found to be very interesting from just what I was getting from his, um, from his uh, presentation. Um, I, I see that only white men became state legislators, um, and then of course uh, Alabama Black Codes as well actually made it difficult for African Americans to of course gain access to the ballot box even though uh, we were in the period of reconstruction. Um, not only that, office. for statewide office, yes I'm sorry for statewide office, let me let me clarify that. Um, in 1868, we're looking also at the, um, the penal codes that were very harsh for African Americans during this particular time as well and um, the uh, the role of African Americans to the to the white race in general during this particular time was uh, very interesting. Um, moving on to the next discussion by Dr. Larkin. Uh, Dr. Larkin, of course, began her discussion uh, dealing with 19. Um, I'm sorry, dealing with uh, uh, actually she ended in the 1930s, but she began in the 1870s, and she noted how the uh, Republican and federal governments. Uh, they began, that commitment to African Americans actually began to collapse during this time. And one of the reasons as to why this is probably the case is because, of course, this is the time when the, the, uh, the compromise took place and many of the Union troops were actually being removed from the southern states as a result of the haynes tilden Compromise. So a lot of the commitment that was in place prior to that particular compromise began to dissipate. Um, also, um, she begins to discuss, or she discussed the, uh, the, the need 
for these conservative bourbons to offset uh, the white vote during this particular time and how also violence was used as a means of keeping blacks away from the ballot box as well. So this was a common theme that we saw with the earlier discussion that was uh, given by Dr. English. And in addition to this, she mentioned how black and white Republican leaders were murdered um, in their attempts to, of course, gain access to the ballot box and discussion of the Alabama Farmers Alliance or the Populist Party and its uh, presence in Alabama and how this, of course, actually strengthened uh, the Democratic um, ideological base here in uh, the state. Again, she also mentioned black codes, which were used very heavily um, to, of course, keep African Americans away from the ballot box and uh, mentioning uh, or some discussion of uh, some of the measures such as lynching, some of the measures such as, um, we'll say, poll taxes, and also literacy tests, which were utilized to ensure that African Americans had the proper knowledge or the proper connections to actually gain access to the ballot box. So that was an interesting point that was made by Dr. Larkin as well. And then, of course, she ended with, um, with the 1930s. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, she ended with the 1930s, if I'm not mistaken, mistaken, and then it was 1900. I'm sorry, and then also how the South was controlled by the Northern industrialists and more later able to control the economy. Dr. Norell, um, he gave us four fundamental themes, and the first being African Americans have always been in the process of pushing for voting rights. Uh, the second one being the inconsistent national government, the inconsistency of national government, and also how whites have opposed, I have three of them here, how whites, whites have opposed blacks having voting rights or political power altogether. So he begins his, with your, his discussion with the 1930s and how there was a, a sustained civil rights movement which began in Alabama around this particular time and some discussion of Booker T. Washington's uh, movement and his assessment or helping with uh, um, African Americans, not just necessarily with the right to vote, but with education as well, that being one of the biggest things there. Um, he discussed the populist movement being defeated in 1896 and how Washington fought against the populist movement both publicly and privately, but this was something that was lost even though he um, fought very hard and, um, and tried to uh, end this. Um, he also discussed Washington's relationship with the whites and also the, uh, the secret support um, challenge to the, the grandfather clause in Louisiana as well. Um, there was some discussion of uh, Theodore Roosevelt, Thomas Good Jones, who was appointed to the vacant judgeship, and then also um, how Washington helped in getting blacks enfranchised as well. There was some discussion of the, of the NAACP and the challenges to the white primaries and the significance of voting organizations starting in the 1930s, specifically 36, 37, and 38. Um, and this was a result of incentives for blacks to change their political affiliation from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party because this was a realignment time um, in American politics or a shift in, um, in or a realignment with other political parties when it, come, when it came to the ideological um, underpinnings of the party, uh, or both parties for that matter. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court also um, began to change. This is another point that uh, Dr. Norell mentions as a result of the Roosevelt administration. And we begin to see the court actually uh, beginning to defend the equality of blacks. And of course, um, this movement against the white primary starting in 1941 to 1944. So to kind of culminate all this or to sum all of this up, we've seen some underlying themes um, in each of the presentations that has been given by each of the panelists that's before us today. And as I just indicated, or as I indicated earlier, one of the main things that we witnessed or noticed uh, or heard from them is that uh, there were various measures that were put in place to keep African Americans away from the ballot box and how various individuals have played a role to try to ensure that African Americans can gain access to the ballot box as well. We also have to look at the role of political parties and how the ideological underpinnings of these political parties can play a role in 
shaping the thought processes of people and how this has also shifted over time as well. Um, and this is something I think that plays a, a huge role in what we look at today or something that we can see today when we look at the political scene and what's happening on the national scale today and how African Americans have, um, I won't say that African Americans are not voting because they are, um, however, how there have been measures that are put in place to kind of still, you know, keep African Americans not involved politically, so to speak. Um, and we look at the current government shutdown, and of course we're up and running now, as I've uh, got a glimpse of as of last night. Um, so, or this morning rather, so we're up and running now. But there are various methods that were actually put in place, you know, that would just, um, I would say, that would actually, you know, try to discourage African Americans from reaching the ballot box or going to the ballot box to cast their votes. Uh, are there any questions for any of the panelists at all? Dr. Finley, <coughs> Dr. Finley, if you don't mind, okay. before you ask your question, we'll bring the microphone to you. I think Dr. Patty referring to Francis Cardozo yeah, from South Carolina. South Carolina. Right. He later on moved to Washington, D.C. He was responsible for uh, mandating public education in the state but the federal legislation would not occur until a bit, a bit uh, later. I think that's, that's about a month of speaking. I just want us to know that. <laughs> the question I have is for, for both uh, Dr. English and Dr. Larkin. I noticed that you all uh, covered that you were looking at the 1890s there and the Reuben Cole losing the election and who had been, I believe, Commissioner of Agriculture. Uh, as I look at that particular period, I was struck by the argument that, that there were some electoral reform change, changes going on at that time, and the claim was to, uh, to prevent corruption. Uh, and I thought that that was very interesting, and I remember one of the arguments at that time was, well, what is a, what would be considered a straight vote or a right vote? And the answer was that any vote that would be for us. Uh, my question then is that as you look at some of the changes today, particularly in Alabama, what are you talking about voter ID or gerrymandering? Uh, what would your uh, comparison be, uh, as you look particularly at that 1890 period and on into the 1901 Constitution and events of today? Well, as I said uh, earlier, elections are not uh, fraud free. But I'm not going to get into the, I mentioned earlier about that election uh, was suspected to be ballot stuffing. But, you know, as I tell my students, and this book deals with redistricting, drawing lines, and I think that was a fundamental uh, strength of um, the Voting Rights Act because it gave uh, citizens like ourselves opportunities to submit redistricting plans to the state legislature. Not saying that we can't do that now, but I think it was more of an impetus for groups to do that. You can draw, if you have the population base, you can draw that district to elect the kind of candidate you want to elect. So I'm just giving you an example of how I feel things like at-large elections, um, uh, the inability probably for, uh, for, for people to draw districts uh, to, uh, to, to, to attest to my majority populations, and those majority populations I'm speaking of would be minorities, um, I think is a, a problem that we face. Uh, and basically, you, I mean, there are other kinds of methods. I mentioned in the paper about uh, the period of disenfranchisement, how the bottom line is that appointive offices became more noticeable rather than elected offices. I mean, you can just shift the wheel 
uh, right or left, depending on who's in charge. And so I, I think it, minorities need to be need to be um, aware of that. I'm working on another paper of, of voting rights, and I think the Shelby case could have better been defended. And I leave it like that. It need not, in my opinion, probably have reached the Supreme Court as it did. I just think we were asleep at the wheel. And, you know, that's my greatest concern. Dr. Uh, Larkin, would you explain to our students what the Shelby case was? Oh, somebody, please do that. Okay, well, I'll let, okay. Well, Shelby versus Alabama is a challenge against the, uh, the, the voting rights, the current Voting Rights Act. And basically what the court did was say that we live in a new day. The strongest sections are sections three and five. Sections, and they give the right of um, southern states and other states that had de jure segregation, meaning by law. Some of the same things we discussed here. To go through pre-clearance with the Justice Department before they make any electoral changes. That has been done away with. And that was a protection for, excuse me, for minority populations to have the Justice Department review some of the changes that politicians would make concerning voting. And so now you have the, uh, you know, voting IDs, and uh, you have redrawing districts uh, that do not necessarily recognize majority populations. And the undercurrent theme, which I heard a decade, of, well, maybe not that long, but I think so, a decade ago, is that for African Americans, that they had reached their maximum political strength, which I argued against every time I hear it. Because when you have a population base, that's the essence of population. There is no ma maximum political strength if you have the population to support the vote. Dr. Finley, um, I think there is there's quite a bit of continuity, as Dr. Norell said, with regard. You know, it's it's a nuanced continuity, but it's still there. But there are also some differences. For example, in the 1890s, um, one could be lynched simply for wanting to vote. And for those of you, well, everyone here understands now, because most of our students are gone. Um, that wouldn't happen today. One would not be physically that is lynched. But there is. Um, a political lynching that's going on. The political lynching in part is due to a very simple strategy by leading ultra-conservative Republicans. And they've done it. They did it during Reconstruction. They did it through what's um, deemed the modern civil rights movement of the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And that is to convince um, lower socioeconomic class white folks that they actually are operating on their behalf. That is, they convince the poor folks, the plain folks, some folks would call them some other things that are more derogatory and I won't, that by ensuring that black folks in particular, and now of course we're talking about other so-called people of color, including Hispanic speaking Latinos, as long as they are not leaders in the political, economic, and other areas, then their selfhood is secure, their personage is secure, their place in society is secure. So that many of these individuals believe that as long as black folks are not in high level positions, then they still are a level above black folks and other social minorities in the pecking order of the country. I mean, take the Tea faction of the Republican Party, and I want to emphasize this. I, you know, the Tea Party is not a bona fide party; it's a faction of the Republican Party. Regardless of what some individuals try to say, well, it's not partisan. Well, yes, it is. Just look at the look at the look at the engagements. Look at the population among the Tea faction of that particular party. Okay, one of the mainstays of that particular side originally was this opposition to high taxes. Well, tax representation taxes. And if that's the case, and it is the case, then every person in the T faction should love Barack Obama, particularly those in Alabama, because according to many studies, most legitimate studies, 90% of Alabamians, that is, who uh, have to pay a working income tax, that rate is going down. <laughs> so why are you against Barack Obama's and Barack Obama's policies if indeed you are for lower taxes. You look at credit cards, you look at public education, you can just run the gambit. 
So once you remove all of those purported reasons for being a part of that faction, it comes down to one thing. And that one thing is what I'm pointing at. I, w I would like to uh, answer, uh, comment on your question. Back again, look at those constitutions. Particularly 1875 is critical. Where the district's line that was running east-west through the state that gave you a, 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 a Turner, Harrison, Rapier, after 1875, you don't have anyone. Why? The district lines now are running north-south, which dilates the boat. Now, uh, as far as more than time is concerned with the Tea Party and the rise of conservative uh, congressmen, I trace that.